Hey class, welcome to module five. Um, in this module, we're gonna do uh, a deeper dive into individual stress and crisis models. Now I know this is a class about family stress, uh, or families in stress, but we have to look at the individual models to build up to the family models. You need to understand what individuals go through as well as what families go through. And so in this, we're gonna present this module, we're gonna present four models to you. What is the natural history of individual reactions to disaster? Having been through COVID, having been through hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, family disasters, you've all experienced some, some history of natural disasters. We're very prone to them in New Orleans. And so you'll understand some elements of this model. We're also going to look to the components of an emotional crisis. Uh, what is uh, happening to an individual during an emotional crisis? four phases of crisis development, and finally, the crisis paradigm. So if you're ready, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so as I've indicated, we're gonna look through four different models here. And in these models, there are different terminology used for each of these models. Uh, and the terminology can be seen on table 5.1, which you're gonna have a little difficulty of seeing because of my little talking head screen down here. It's gonna block part of it, but you can go right to the book, look at table 5.1 and see the different terminology used. So let's look at some of those. Here you see the table 5.1, which I've tried to copy out of my book. It's not a great copy and you can't see the lower right hand corner, but across the top of the page, you can see the four models and then down the page, you can see the verbiage or the wording used to describe these models. Now here's some things to consider when you're looking at these models. If you're working with people who are experiencing a disaster, who've been through a disaster or a catastrophic event, then you would want to choose the natural history of individual reactions to disaster as your model to work with. But if you're working with somebody experiencing a minor event, then you might want to consider, and by minor event, it could feel subjectively very major to the individual, but it's not a catastrophic event, then you would want to look through the components of an emotional crisis. The third model are the four phases of development, crisis development. And if you're working with somebody who's experiencing a crisis of physical illness, for example, this might be a good one to choose. And then finally, if you're unsure, the crisis paradigm model would help you decide uh, which one to look at to understand what you're addressing with the client or clients that you're sitting with. So without further ado, let's delve into these, starting with the natural history of individual reactions to disaster. The natural history of individual reactions to disaster was developed by Tyhurst. And Tyhurst distinguished three overlapping periods or phases of a reaction to a disaster. The period of impact, the period of recoil, and then the post-traumatic period. Now, each of these is characterized according to time by stressor and by the psychological manifestations or phenomenon that we see as a result of these. So let's delve a little bit more into these. The period of impact is a period of experiencing the maximum impact and the most direct effect of the initial stress. Now, a natural disaster happens relatively quickly in time. Uh, it could be three minutes, it could be an hour and a half or a few hours, but it may vary. For example, a hurricane could be something that moves through very quickly and floods the city and moves on, or it could be something like Katrina that just kind of stays over the city for a long time. Um, it could be, say, a house fire where um, you Watch your house burn down. That could take an hour and a half, right? It could be a tornado which zips through and leaves a, a swath of destruction in its path. Now, this begins with the period of impact, begins with the initial stressor, but continues until the stressor is no longer operating. And there's three reactions that an individual might have. Number one is cool and collected, aware, assessing the situation, formulating a plan, and then implementing that plan. It could be a normal reaction, which most people have, stunned and bewildered, 
not quite aware of one's emotions yet because we know from grieving that the initial uh, Kubler-Ross's grieving stages, that the first reaction is one of shock and denial. So you're not completely unaware of one's emotions, but the predominant emotion could be fear. And then there's a third reaction during the period of impact that might be an inappropriate reaction. Confusion, paralyzing anxiety, hysterical crying, even screaming. Uh, that would be an irrational or inappropriate uh, response to disaster. So people would typically fall into one of one or three of these. Then comes the period of recoil to which we turn next. Now the initial stressor is over. And this period may last from several hours to two days. It's kind of the reaction. It's like the, oh my God, feeling of what just happened. It begins once the individual avoids the impact of the stressor and then lasts until feeling secure. Now, if they didn't avoid the impact of the stressor, they're probably in the hospital or dead, right? So for people that have endured the initial impact and are now in recoil, it, this period lasts until everything is stable again. The focus is on the immediate past, what happened just before the storm, and then upon or the disaster, right? Because it might not be a storm. And then the initial stressor or the disaster itself. And there's a gradual awareness of what one just experiences. It comes, the shock and denial wears off and they begin to really think about it. And that's a period of anxiety, fear, anger, even childlike dependency upon others and needing to talk about the experience. I know that after Katrina, I went from a small shelter to large shelter to hotel rooms all over the place where people who had been had experienced a disaster and interviewed them about what they had been through it. Everybody wanted to talk. And no matter who they were, they invited me into their space and wanted to talk about the experience because that's a unique feature of this period of recoil. Then we move into the post-traumatic post period to which we turn next. In the post-traumatic period, the person is now fully aware of the impact of the stressor and how their world has changed as a result, the altered environment. This will last for the remainder of the person's life. My father was born during the time of the Great Depression and talked about the Great Depression for the rest of his life. My kids will always be impacted, as will I, by Katrina. We're all going to be impacted by uh, Ida. Uh, after a year after Katrina, almost to the day, a tornado hit my house that kind of went through the city. I will always be impacted by that. It won't be acute, but it will certainly be in the back of my mind. It's changed the way I view New Orleans as a result. The focus in the post-traumatic period is on the past, the stressor, upon the present, how their world has changed, and upon the future, what does this mean for me in my daily living into the future? There are emotional disturbances associated with this post-traumatic period. They can include anxiety, fatigue, just this kind of sense of exhaustion, reliving the catastrophe, kind of having it replay over and over in either flashbacks or just kind of memories, dreams of the event, and possibly depression. There could also be physical complaints, nausea, gastric upset, headaches, and these are all related to the emotions that the person uh, has experienced in this period of time. So those are the three periods of uh, individual reactions to disaster. Next, we're going to turn to the components of an emotional crisis. Next slide. So the components of an emotional crisis are an acute crisis state and an intersection of the hazardous events in the situation, the participating factors for the incident, and then one's vulnerability, their emotional vulnerability, their thoughts, the cognitive vulnerability, and their behavioral vulnerability. So let's delve into these a little bit more. Next slide. So there's a hazardous event or a situation. Sifneos in 1960 defined a hazardous event or a situation as a difficult or dangerous situation that becomes stressful to some individuals and maybe not to others. Some types of hazards that might occur are environmental hazards, including things like um, situations result from a change in one's environment 
or changes in the individual, like the loss of a family member or the disturbed behavior of a family member, uh, a disabling illness, new arrivals in the family, like uh, births or adoption, change in civil status, like divorce or separation, changes in roles within the family or, or in their world, um, like going from being a line worker to being a supervisor, going from being a um, supervisor to being the CEO, changes in work, um, shifting to a new job or having some uh, crisis happen at work, like downsizing where you need to take on other people's responsibilities. Entering school could be an environmental hazard, right? Think about when you first came back to school. Or a family's isolation from the community could be an environmental hazard. There's also individual hazardous events, which include things like change in physical status, becoming physically ill, especially a long-term physical illness, an incapacitating injury where you're no longer able to do the things you once did. Puberty, an individual hazard, right? This kind of crazy change from being a child to being adult and all the vocal changes and the physiological changes and the social changes that go with it. Menopause, uh, pregnancy, a middle life crisis, or the onset of mental illness might be some of those events. These all force the individual into a state of vulnerability, which leads us to the next slide, vulnerability. Now vulnerability or a vulnerable state refers to the person's painful, unpleasant state in reaction to a hazardous event or situation. Stressors lead a person to more vulnerability in a crisis. We assess vulnerability emotionally, what is the person feeling? Cognitively, what is the person thinking? Behaviorally, what is the person doing in response to this crisis? Now, a person may recover quickly. Uh, some people get over their crises very quickly, and other people may be vulnerable for years. Upon experiencing another stress, which happens afterwards, a person may enter an acute crisis state. Now, next we're gonna look at the precipitating factors or the incident that led to the crisis on the next slide. So the precipitant is an event that moved the person from being vulnerable to now being in crisis. This is a state of disequilibrium or unbalance. Think about this as the straw that broke the camel's back. It's just one thing added on to everything else that just, boom, shifts you off balance. Precipitants include things like a talk with a doctor about one's health and realizing, oh my God, I got cancer. Or um, talking with a teacher about a failing grade. Talking with a clergy about a moral issue you're having. A lawyer about a legal issue a nurse, a job supervisor, a police officer, uh, think about getting pulled over, a friend, a psychiatrist, a social worker. It could be an impending school or physical exam. Could happen after a fight. Uh, could happen with a new job, admission or discharge from a hospital. Could occur in a meeting, could be an engagement, a trip, a child's school expulsion. These are all examples of precipitants, or straws that bring the camels back. Now, if the precipitant or the crisis occurs, excuse me, if the crisis occurs immediately after the hazard, the event and the crisis are said to be the same. The precipitant is the crisis. However, sometimes the precipitant can happen here and the crisis not happen until over here later on, and that would be a delayed crisis which leads us to the next slide for the acute crisis state. So let's move on. In an acute crisis state, acute means immediate, urgent, right? The acute crisis state is the state of active crisis. It has four primary areas of reaction. Affective, what is the person feeling? Perceptive or cognitive, what's going on in the person's head? Behavioral, what is the person doing in response to the crisis? Are they drinking more? Do they take up smoking again? Are they cutting themselves? Are they considering 
well, that would be a thought considering suicide, but maybe, um, you know, the behavioral aspects. And then biophysical, what are the physiological components of the acute crisis state? A nausea, sickness, headaches, shakes. Um, the components of an emotional crisis end at the crisis, and they don't really address what happens to a person after crisis. To look to that, we really need to think about the four phases of crisis development to which we turn next. The four phases of crisis development are based on the assumption that many mental health disorders resulted from maladaptation, which we'll look at more in the next module, maladaptation and bonadaptation, but we've already looked at it a little bit with the ABCX and double ABCX models. But these, this maladaptation or maladjustment to crisis may result in a mental health disorder. A poorly managed crisis can lead to a mental health disorder, such as depression or anxiety or even um, psychosis. This model applies better to crises that are gradual, like disease, rather than sudden, such as natural disasters or acute emotional stressors happening in the moment. Let's move into the phases now, starting with phase one. Next slide. Phase one begins with the initial rise in tension and stress from the impact of the stressor. The task of phase one is to act on the stressor, to problem solve, to reduce its consequences. You want to reduce it, reduce its consequences, or find some kind of escape. Now this requires goal-directed problem solving based in the world of reality. One way of problem solving would be to get high, get drunk, or to have a psychotic break from reality. That would not be goal-directed and problem solving, goal-directed problem solving, right? Because yeah, it's not based in a, in a world of reality. Um, an individual's interpretation of what happened how they view the event determines what they do next. Remember from your study of the ABCs of thinking differently or uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that an activating event is moderated by a belief or a perception of what's going on, which leads to a reaction. Uh, and that reaction could be a behavioral choice. So individuals initially respond with what has worked in the past, the usual strategies so that they can maintain balance. However, if those strategies don't work, they find themselves unbalanced, and we are pushed in a position of having to decide with the client what to do next. That could be something like cognitive behavioral therapy, could be problem solving, or it could be a solution-focused model of therapy. And that's coupled with social supports like support groups or increasing one's supportive network. Those are good interventions the kind of cognitive strategies coupled with supportive strategies to help people maintain balance. When an individual's normal strategies don't work, however, then the person may move to phase two, to which we turn next. Phase two begins when an individual's normal stress-relieving strategies fail to work. This leads to an increase in tension and stress. Now, the person because they've tried everything they know how to try and it hasn't worked, now they're feeling really stressed out. Now they're feeling really unbalanced, really scared, really confused. And if this somehow isn't resolved in phase two, then the person moves to phase three, to which we turn next. Phase three results in an even higher rise in tension and stress, which requires a person to find new ways of coping. As we talked about, individuals rely on the customary defense mechanisms, things they've normally tried, like denial, selective inattention, ignoring aspects of their world, or even withdrawal during this phase. When these or new coping te techniques relieve the tension and, and balance the person out again, the problem may be solved. This is the phase when individuals or families are most likely to seek help from an outside source, you, because you're the social worker, as they seek to develop new ways of coping because what they've tried in the past hasn't worked. Now, 
If they don't find relief from stress, if they don't find adequate ways of coping in this phase, then they move to phase four, which is where we turn next. Phase four is major disorganization. The crisis deepens. Now the person is really out of whack. This is much like Ty Hurst's post-traumatic stress period or Sipneo's acute crisis state in the components of an emotional crisis. The tension stress continues to rise as the problem or stressor continues. And it may result in severe acting out like suicidal cry for help, or even a, a fully intending to kill themselves because they can't handle it anymore, or major depression, or a psychotic reaction. So that gives you the four phases of crisis development and how it moves from being a stressor to a crisis in an individual's life. Next, we're gonna to turn to the crisis paradigm. Hoff's crisis paradigm attempts to explain what happens when a socio-psycho-cultural event or from a social-psycho-cultural perspective. Now look at the, four, the three terms there. Socio, what's happening in their social world, Psycho, what's happening in their psychological world, and cultural, what's happening in their world around them, the cultural world. To the right, you can see a diagram with four boxes. Those four boxes have intertwined circles in each. On the left, you see the origin of the crisis. It could be situational, like a material money kind of thing. It could be personal or physical, like a acute illness. It could be an interpersonal loss, like a divorce or a death. It could be transitional, like moving from one life passage to the next, moving from college to the world of work, moving from being a social work student to now being a social work professional. And it could be a social, a social, cultural kind of origin. Uh, one's values no longer fit with the situation or the way we've been socialized no longer is working. Um, we are now in the world of work and the uh, strategies of coping in the neighborhood now are no longer effective in the professional world. It could be deviance, that we've committed a crime or somebody has committed a crime against us. And it could be conflict, an argument or an ongoing uh, problem with somebody else. Now, notice how these circles indicate how the crisis and the interventions are interrelated. There are solid lines that move from the origins to their manifestations, to aids, to resolution, to show how one could intervene. The broken lines, you see those at the bottom, from manifestations to negative resolutions, show the dangers of a negative resolution when aids and resources are absent or insufficient, and how that leads back then to a continued crisis. So let's step a little bit deeper into this model, starting with crisis origins. Crisis can be simple, a single starting point, or complex with multiple starting points. Crisis, crises with simple origins are easier to solve and usually result in more positive outcomes. Complex crises, those that are multifaceted or coming from multiple sources, require a more multifaceted approach. Those crises that are situational or transitional are easier to cope with. Those that are social, social and cultural and therefore are less amenable to control by an individual are much more difficult. Think about, for example, uh, the police department and how the police department responds to uh, black folks versus white folks. Uh, we know this is a, a DWB, for example, driving while black. Those things are harder to fix. And when one has that kind of crisis, it's much more difficult to deal with. Some crises have elements of situation, transition, and social cultural and require multiple interventions or interventions on multiple levels. So think about one that might be, let's go back to DWB. It's a situation getting pulled over by the cop. 
but it didn't happen uh, before you were driving. And so now you're 16 and have a driver's license and it's your first time getting pulled over the, by the cop. And so it's also involved in this transition in your life and it's social cultural. The system of policing is organized in ways that are racialized. And so that would be an example of a crisis that could span all of those, right? And require intervention on multiple levels. Next slide, please. Now we move to thinking about situational crises. Remember crisis, crisis origins are situational, transitional and social cultural. So let's look at situational for a minute. They're typically unanticipated and difficult to prepare for. There are three categories, material, which are uh, environmental, things like fires or natural disasters. There's also personal and physical situational crises that happen to individuals, such as heart attacks, illness, or disfigurement. There's also interpersonal, such as social losses, like the death of a loved one, or separation and divorce. So those would be examples of situational crises that had their origin in situations. Now, let's turn to those that are transitional. Transitional crises are the result of things like anticipated life passages, uh, moving from student to graduate, moving from adolescent to adulthood, moving out of your parents' house, moving um, across town. Things like moving from childhood to puberty, or childhood to young adulthood, or marriage, leaving home, enrolling in university, change of professions. These are all transitions, anticipated life patches. But because they're anticipated, doesn't make them any less difficult to deal with. Now let's turn to social cultural. Crises that have their origin in social cultural factors are things like um, values, what we value, we have a crisis of values. Um, when our faith perspective no longer is adequate to deal with what we understand or when our previous values are challenged. Um, socialization, how we were raised is no longer adequate to deal with what we're going through. Deviance, uh, when we've done something against the law and are now facing the consequences. And conflict, like arguments, fights, um, could be with a family member or it could be with a boss or it could be with a person in the neighborhood, right? Another example would be discrimination or marginalization. These kind of are rooted in a culture of white supremacy that marginalizes people that are different, but also a cisgendered world that marginalizes people who are LGBTQI+, uh, or a world that values able bodies, and now you find yourself in a, um, you know, you're paralyzed or you have some disability, right? These would be examples of discrimination and marginalization that could bring about a crisis. And deviancy, which could be the act of self, a choice that we made, or it could be where uh, we're the victim of a crime. All of these can bring about crises, which lead us then to thinking about uh, what do we do, the natural and formal crisis care. So let's move on to that slide. Natural care is crisis care performed by those who are other than professionals, family, somebody from church, somebody who's a friend or a confidant in your world. Formal care is care that's provided by paraprofessionals or professionals. This is the kind of care you will be doing as a professional social worker. Now, traumatic situation stressors or crises call for grief work. They call for material aid, helping somebody put their life back together. They call for social supports, helping people find the supports around them that can help keep them organized. And it calls for crisis counseling. Those crises or stressors with their roots in the transition, they call for contemporary rites of passages or rituals that facilitate transition to the next phase. Sitting down and having the sex talk with your child, talking about 
um, you know, the other talk, the DWB talk, or what to do when the, when the cop accosts you because of the color of your skin. Those are rites of passage. Now, in some societies, like Judaism, there's the bar mitzvah and the bat mitzvah, or, um, you know, there are other rites of passage, like registering to vote, registering for the draft, getting one's driver's license. These are all rites of passage um, rituals that can help, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> help a person move from crisis to the next phase. And then those crises that have their roots in cultural values or social structure call for social change strategies. Things like protesting or advocacy or policy change, etc. And notice that in our society, things like the rash of police beatings and killing of black motorists or uh, black folks who were selling cigarettes at the corner store and then ended up dead at the hands of the police led to the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Or the rash of uh, violence against women, um, especially in the film industry, led to the Me Too movement, uh, where women stood up and said, I've been abused too. Those are forms of protesting, advocacy, and they have led, in many instances, to policy change. Let's move to the next slide. Crisis resolution may be positive, but they can also be negative. A positive crisis resolution occurs when the individual experiences growth and development because of the crisis. The individual acquires new resources and new ways of solving problems. But they can also be negative, that occur when the individual fails and experiences such things as emotional or mental disturbance, where they enact violent, violent behavior against others, or they engage in self-destructive behaviors and or addictions. These would be examples of negative crisis resolution. So you see from the box, we move from box one, the crisis origin, to box two, the, the crisis manifestation, to box three, the AIDS to positive resolution, and then to box four, either a positive manifestation or a negative manifestation. In the case of a negative manifestation, the person then moves back to crisis and starts all over again, working through the, the, uh, the paradigm. So I hope that helped you uh, think through how individuals respond to crisis. With that said, you're now gonna take a quiz on this material and then move to the next elements in the, um, in the module, okay? So work through module five all the way up to and through the discussion board, remembering to post to the discussion board by Wednesday and then post to three students, fellow students, with substantive posts. Remember, there's a, there's a, a fairly adequate, thorough a rubric at the bottom of the discussion board to help you know what I'm looking for. So you're responding to three of your classmates by Saturday at 11.59 p.m. And then I will see you for module six, where we move to the far model. Okay? Peace. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.